Pleasant greetings, brethren. Welcome once again to present Truth to SDA. We are here to study the Sabbath school lesson with you. We are truly happy to be here and we trust that you have been, that you have had a wonderful week studying the Sabbath school lesson. The title of our lesson this week is Satan's Final Deception. And notice that the word deception is pluralized. It is telling us that Satan has several deceptions planned for us. Yes, he wants to keep us in darkness. So he has planned all sorts of deceptions to keep us in the dark. But we are thankful to God for having shown us these things. We are truly thankful to have these lessons studying for we are being enlightened that we do not fall into the enemy's traps. Christ had not fallen in. He was tempted and we are being tempted like him. But his desire is for us to come out conquerors. And so he has given us these wonderful lessons to keep us in the narrow path. As we go forward to look at the scriptures that we are studying, we see that we have Revelation 12, 9, Revelation 16, 13, and 14. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, Ezekiel 8, 16, Ezekiel 20, 1 to 20, Revelation 18, 4 and 5. But before we go further, Sister Cherry will take us through the opening prayer. Let us pray. Our oh, kind and heavenly Father, we are thankful once again for another opportunity whereby we can come and discuss the Sabbath school lesson and break it down. We ask the Lord that you be with us. Be with the internet service, be with the instrument that we are using. Be with our voices that they may be clear enough for everyone, everyone language to understand. Continue to be with us throughout the rest of the Sabbath school lesson study, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, sister. So our memory text is John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As we have seen, as we have been studying, Revelation warns us that the inhabitants of the earth will drink a deadly potion called the wine of Babylon. We heard about this last week. We studied two wines last week. There are false doctrines and teachings that in the end will lead only to death. However, the world is not left without the antidote, the protection against this spiritual poison, the three angels' messages. In this week's lesson, we will continue looking not only at Babylon's deceptions, but at Jesus' plan to save us from them and the death that they would otherwise bring. We'll go forward to see what more we can learn about this or Satan's deceptions. So we are looking at the memory text. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What is it or what does it mean to be sanctified? Christ said in verse 19 of John 17, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So here we are told that it is the truth that sanctifies us. And in the book, Acts of the Apostles, page 565, paragraph 1, we read, True sanctification means perfect love, perfect obedience, perfect conformity to the will of God. We are to be sanctified to God through obedience to the truth. Our conscience must be purged from dead works to serve the living God. So it is the truth. And where do we get the truth? From the Bible, from God's word. We'll be sanctified by obeying the truth. Now, inspiration says further, there is no Bible sanctification for those who cast a part of the truth behind them. Testimonies, volume 1, page, sorry, page 33, paragraph 8. And in one... Selected Messages, page 317, paragraph 2, we read, 
This work cannot go on in the heart while the light on any part of the truth is rejected or neglected. The sanctified soul will not be content to remain in ignorance, but will desire to walk in the light and to seek for greater light. So if we are truly converted, we will be seeking for light. It will be our desire to walk in all the light that is shining on our path, and we will seek for further light. Because God's word is full of light, it can never be exhausted. And the truth we know today will not suffice us for tomorrow. We do not eat today and stay without eating tomorrow. We eat another meal tomorrow. So when tomorrow comes, we will be needing further light, which is in God's word. Now, if you look here, we are seeing that justification is the righteousness by grace. Sanctification means righteousness by faith. Glorification is the righteousness of Christ. And that is what we need, the righteousness of Christ. We cannot enter into eternity without the righteousness of Christ. So let's move forward and see what more we can learn. So we are reading from the Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, page 233, paragraph 1. In Revelation 17, Babylon is represented as a woman, a figure which is used in the scriptures as the symbol of a church. And we did learn this last week, but repetition impresses the mind. We may have forgotten, so we go it again this week. A virtuous woman represents a pure church, a vile woman, an apostate church. Babylon is said to be a harlot, and the prophet beheld her drunken with the blood of saints and martyrs. The Babylon thus described represents Rome, that apostate church which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Christ. But Babylon the harlot is the mother of daughters who follow her example of corruption. Thus are they... Thus are represented those churches that cling to the doctrines and traditions of Rome and follow her worldly practices, and whose fall is announced in the second angel's message. Remember, we studied the second angel's message last week, and it told us that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because she made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Yes, and we learned that this Babylon that was spoken of is none other than the Protestant churches that fall when they receive the message or when they rejected the message of 1844. Yes? So let's move forward and see what more we can learn. So the reason John was shown the vision is made clear by the words of the angel, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great poor that sitteth upon many waters. The angel's interpretation of the waters is given in Revelation 17, 15. Peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The woman sitting on them denotes that the inhabitants, the waters, had fallen into her trap of deception. So she was sitting on them. Brethren, we do not want to be in that position. So as we go through this week's lesson, we will be learning more about the deceptions of Babylon, a universal deception we will also understand about, the immortality of the soul, the center of sun worship. And we'll also learn how to stay from these deceptions. We we'll look at a call to faithfulness and a call to obedience. Now, Sister Cherry will take us through Sunday's lesson as we move forward. Thank you very much, Sister Akins. So we are looking at Sunday, May the 20th, and we are given the way that seemeth right in man's eyes. That's the topic for, for that day. And we are told here, in the context of the last days, Jesus uttered a powerful warning. He says, for false Christs and false prophets shall arise and show signs and wonders to seduce, if, if 
it were possible, the very elect. And that's indeed a powerful statement. But we also see that it says what? False Christ, if you notice the plural there. False prophets, if you notice the plural there. They're going to show signs and wonders. So more and more prophets are going to pop up, more and more prophets are going to be casting out demons and say, claim that they're healing and showing signs and wonders. These are the things that are going to come up. But we are warned here that they are false, right? And that's, you will find in Mark 13, 22, which we're going to look a bit at as we go forward. The question is asked, who are the elect? And he, it says, he later says, and he will send his angel with a great song of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. So these are some of the things that we're going to look at today to really see who are the elect. Because we are given an example of elect here in Matthew 24, 13, but are these the only elect? So we are going to look at Revelation 12, 9. Who is deceived by Satan? That's the question that has been asked. And how do we understand these words? It says, obviously, God is going to have some faithful people in the last days. And he had all, he has had all through the age and inspiration. Told, told us that we have seen that time and time before as we went through the Sabbath school lesson that in each age God has had faithful people and in each age he has had a new generation of truth it's a however though the word in here shows just how widespread Satan deception really is when we look at Revelation 12 and verse 9 so we are also going to look at Proverbs 14 20 and it says what powerful warning is presented in Proverbs 14 12 that's it proverbs 14 12 that's it think true examples of people who had acted based on what they themselves believe was right or even what they believe was god's will but had done evil things what can we learn from these tragic events this is what we are going to look at on the sunday so who are the elect First Peter 1 verse 2 tells us what? Elect according to foreknowledge of God the Father, true sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. If you notice the word sanctification, come back and we'll learn a bit about sanctification. And we see that there is a ladder. We have justification, we have sanctification and we have glorification. So the elect are going to be among those that are what? Sanctified. Because the elect will be those who are obedient to the will of God. To every word that God has uttered, they are going to do it. They're not going to question. They're going to do whatever God asks them to do. They are going to do. So we read from Review and Herald, August the 1st, 1893. And it says what? To all age and in every generation... And in every nation, that's it. Those that believe that Jesus can and will save them personally from sin are the elect and chosen of God. So in every age, there are elect. So those who have gone in the past, who we read from in Matthew, where it says he will gather the, them from the four winds of the earth, they are elect because they are those who have died in Christ. So they would have been elected before they died. And then we have those that are alive. We are looking to be among the elect, aren't we? That's why it says that what? If it was possible, the very elect might be deceived. But the thing is, guess what? It's not possible. It's a if. It is not possible for the elect of God to be deceived. So we continue. It says, they are his peculiar treasure. They obey his call. Are the elect and chosen of God they are his peculiar treasure as it says they obey his call and come out from the world and separate themselves from every unclean thought and unholy practice so those who are chosen of God will come out from among them in practices in thoughts they will purify their mind it will be purged it tells us the Lord is waiting to be gracious to his people. 
to give them an increased knowledge of his paternal character, of his goodness, mercy, and love. He waits to show them his glory. And if they follow on to know the Lord, they shall know that his goings forth are prepared as the morning. And we know that God doesn't give us all the truth at once. That's why it says what? If they follow on to know, he give us a bit by bit. And as we come up a little, and as we do what he asks us to do, he give us more. The elect of God are his, are dear to his heart. This is what we are reading. The elect of God are dear to his heart. They are those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light to show forth his praise, to shine as light amid the darkness of the world. And when we read that, we can think of ourselves, right? We, all, we always say that the Lord has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So let us act as though that we, we want to be among those who are elect. Because all of us are called. It's a many are called, but few are chosen. Help us to be among those that are chosen. So God has given us his requirements. He has given us, he has told us what we are to do as his people. Everything he has outlined for us is that is what we have to do. It says the unjust judge had no special interest in the widow who importuned him for deliverance. Yet in order to rid himself of her pitiful appeals, he heard her plea and delivered her from her advers adversary. But God of his children with infinite love to him, the dearest object on earth in his church. So let us work with God and not work against him, brother. Revelation 12, 9, we were asked the question about who is deceived by Satan. And Revelation 12, 9 says what? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out in, into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So we see that the whole world were deceived. You see, but the good thing about it, amidst this wide deception and falsehood, as Mark 13 said, there will be false cries, false prophets shall arise, showing signs and wonders to seduce. But it went on to tell us, if it were possible, the elect would have been deceived. But we see that the elect is not deceived, showing that in every age, God has a faithful few. Inspiration tells us in Patriarchs and Prophets, Satan is constantly at work, which means he doesn't rest. He's on the back of the elect, right? He's on the back of those who are trying to walk with God, trying to see if he could get them to turn in the path away from God to him. He says, with intense energy and under a thousand disguises to misrepresent the character and government of God. With extensive, well-organized plans and marvelous power, he is working to hold the inhabitants of the world under his deception. God, the one infinite and all wise, sees the end from the beginning. And in dealing with evil, his plans were far-reaching and comprehensive. It was his purpose, not merely to put down the rebellion, but to demonstrate to all the universe the nature of rebellion, of the rebellion, right? It says God's plan was unfolding, showing both his justice and his mercy, and fully vindicating his wisdom and righteousness in dealing with evil. You see the God that we serve? You see why we have to really take a look at our inner lives? Hear what Proverbs tell us. This is why we have to really search our heart. Proverbs tells us what? Well, chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way 
which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So sometimes we may think that we are on the right path, but we are not. As inspiration tells us, we think that we are all right, but we are all wrong. We think we are right. Matthew 7, 13 and 15 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth into, unto life. And few there be that find it. This coincides so much with Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seemeth right. And it tells us that many who is on this way that seem not right is heading on the broad road. Because the straight road, the strict narrow road, cannot carry man that think they are right. Hear what we read in Mark 13, 22, that false Christ and false prophet will arise, right? So we must keep our Yards up, we must put on the whole armor of God. We are told not until we are born of the Spirit do we turn from the way that seemeth right to the straight and narrow path. The broad way is broad for one to carry all that sin offers, but the straight way is narrow enough to exclude everything but the traveler himself. But only few choose to deny the desires of the flesh and forsake sin in all its forms and turn from the way that seemeth right, but actually leads to that. Satan's deception will be more subtle, his assaults more determined. And we are told in Mark 13, if it were possible, he would lead us straight the elect. But it is not possible. God has given men no liberty to depart from his requirements, we are told. The Lord has declared to Israel, ye shall not do. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. But ye shall observe and hear all these words which I command thee. That's Deuteronomy 12, 8 and 28. In deciding upon any course of action, we are not to ask whether we can see that harm will result from it, but whether it is in keeping with the will of God. So in our going forth, in everything that we are going to do, we should think, would God have us to do this, but not look back to think, would there be harm in the way, or may, may this be in the way, or may that take place? Acts 9, 1 and 2. Read with me. It says, And Saul, yet breeding out threatenings and slaughter against the disciple. And this we are looking at is the question that was asked when it says to think through of examples of people who have acted based on what they themselves believe was right or even what they believe was God's will, but really and truly. They were not. Okay? So, what we are doing is answering the question. Right? That was asked in the Sabbath school lesson. About examples of persons who think they were doing right. Who think they were doing the will of God. But indeed, they were not. So we read again Acts 9, 1 and 2. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this, of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Right? 
So what we read here, you can turn your Bibles to Acts 9, 1 and 2 and see that Paul thought he was doing a good thing when he went to the high priest and requested that he go to Damascus and bring bond with a man or woman from the synagogues back to Jerusalem. Hear what inspiration say commenting on it. In doing this work, Saul honestly thought he was persecuting an ignorant, fanatical sect. He did not realize that he himself was the deluded and deceived one, and that he was ignorantly following the manner of the prince of darkness. In reference to this zeal, Paul himself says that he was what? Exceedingly mad against them. I persecute this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. You see, brethren, and Paul, he had a high office. For you to go to the priest and tell him, this is what you want to do, or this is what you demand. It shows the position to and respect and level that he was at. So inspiration reminds us here. Testimonies to ministers. We see here that men in authority are not always to be obeyed. Even though they may profess to be teachers of Bible doctrine, there are many today who feel indignant and aggrieved that any voice should be raised presenting ideas that differ from their own in regards to the point of religious belief. Have they not long advocated their ideas as truth? That's a question. So the priests and the rabbis reason in apostolic days. What mean these men who are unlearned? They said, some of them were mere fishermen who are presenting ideas contrary to the doctrines which the learned priests and rulers are teaching the people. They have no right to meddle with the fundamental principles of our faith. And a lot of times, if we look even back to us, these questions are asked in our ranks. So let us be careful that what Proverbs chapter 14 reminds us that there is a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I hand over to Sister Akin. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. You have beautifully brought us through Sunday's lesson. And what a lesson. What a lesson indeed. Brethren, we need to take these things in heart to heart. We need to ponder these things. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That is why we are told to seek the Lord, to hear what he has to say. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge the, the Lord. That's what the wise man says to us also in the book of Proverbs. And what a lesson from Paul too. Inspiration says that God saw the zeal that he had and he didn't pass him off. God could have put a stop to Paul's persecution of the saints. He could have dealt out the same, the same, um, the same attitude that Paul exhibited towards God's people. God could have dealt out the same measure unto Paul, but he didn't. He looked beyond what he was doing to what he could do in on his behalf. And God saw that Paul could do a great work for him. How do we treat those who have wronged us? What do we do with them? Do we give them a piece of our mind? Do we give them what we think they deserve? Do we treat them in a similar way that they treat us? Do we cast them off and forget that we had ever known them? What do we do? Or do we treat them the way God treated them? Paul, this is something for us to ponder, brethren. We will move forward into Monday's lesson. 
and yours truly will be taking us through. And the topic for Monday is the old lie of immortality. We were told to read Revelation 16, 13, and 14, and Revelation 18, 2, and 23. What allusions to spiritualism, what allusions to spiritualism do you find in these verses? And it says such expressions as the dwelling of, sorry, such expressions as the dwelling place of demons or the spirits of demons and sorcery all indicate demonic activity. No wonder we have been warned that of the two great deceptions in the last days, one will be the immortality of the soul. Yes. We learned much about this last two quarters ago, I think, in when we were studying in last part of 2022 on death, dying, and the future hope, remember? Yeah. We did quite a lot on this same topic. But let's go again through some of it. So we were also told to read Ecclesiastes 9.5, Job 19, 25 to 27, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, and Revelation 14, 13. What clear instruction did God give his people about life after death? And where do we find our hope? So one of the pillars of Babylonian deception is a false understanding of death, which centered on the idea of the immortality of the soul. It prepares the way for the deceptive influence of spiritualism. If you believe that the dead in some form live on and might even be able to communicate with us, then what protection do you have from any of the myriad deceptions that Satan has? If someone whom you thought were your dead mother or child or someone else beloved were suddenly to appear and talk to you, how easy would it be to be fooled by your senses? This has happened in the past. It happens in these days too. And certainly, as we near the very final days, will happen again. Our only protection is to stand firmly rooted in what the Bible teaches and to cling to the biblical teaching about death as a sleep until the second coming of Jesus. So, Bridget, there are many of us who are caught in this trap. We know it. But our only safeguard is to trust in the word of God, not in what we believe. For many of the things we think are biblical are not biblical at all they have no foundation in the word of god so that is why we are being admonished to study the word of god jesus said search as for hidden treasure so we'll move forward and see what more we can learn from inspiration concerning the old lie of immortality and in revelation 16 13 and 14 we read and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets. False prophet, sorry. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So here we are told that these Unclean spirits, three unclean spirits are the spirits of devils working miracles. Do you believe in miracles? There are many people who believe in miracles. Yes, miracles do work. God still works miracles. But Satan is also working miracles. How do we know the difference? That is why we need to study God's word so we can know the full truth, not just a part of it. Commenting on this very verse, these very verses, inspiration says, after repeating the verse, the verses, inspiration, inspiration continues to say, except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word, the whole world will be swept into the ranks of this delusion. The people are fast being lulled to a fatal the of the wrath of God 
And that reading comes to us from darkness before dawn. And we are told that unless we study the word of God, for that is the only way we can be kept safe from these delusions, by studying the word of God. Let's move forward and see what more we can learn. Revelation 18.2. And it reads, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and it's become the habitation of devils and the Hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Revelation 18.23 says, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by, their, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So here we are learning something more about spiritualism Babylon is fallen and has become the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird and inspiration says to us while multitudes are falling into the snares of the devil and as he is endeavoring to wipe out the church the third angel's message breaks through with mighty power and a loud cry saying Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18.4. And on that Thursday's lesson, we will learn much more about Revelation 18.4 and the call to come out of Babylon. And as the cry of the angel messenger, sorry, and as the cry of the angel messenger, that's the messenger, the angel, Rings through the earth, a great multitude of all nations leave the false, but popular system of worship, and against all earthly favor, take their stand with the saints under the protection of the divine power. This will incur the wrath of the dragon. So, while the third angel's message is being given, or while the loud cry is being given, Many will come out of Babylon because they heard. They heard that Babylon is fallen. The angels said that Babylon is fallen. They would have heard and make the decision to stand with God's people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And they will not care who doesn't like it. It says they will leave the popular system and under the divine, the divine Power, sorry, under the protection of divine power, they will leave and this will incur the wrath of the dragon. But they will leave and we say praise God for those who will hear and leave. Let's go forward and see what more inspiration has to tell us. So what does the word of God say about life after death? Many people will believe the deceptions. They will believe that their dead loved ones have come back to them. Many are even now going to these places, the sciences, to talk to their dead loved ones. But what does the Bible teach? Ecclesiastes 9.5 tells us, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So when a man is dead, he stays dead. Inspiration says to us, from Council for the Church 331, paragraph 1, But the word of God and the stern testimony of facts declare that sorcery is practiced in this age as verily as in the days of the old-time magicians. The ancient system of magic is, is in reality the same as what is now known as modern spiritualism. Satan is finding access to thousands of minds by presenting himself before the guys. 
Sorry. By presenting him. So just to repeat, Satan is finding access to thousands of minds by presenting himself under the guise of departed friends. The scriptures declare that the dead know not anything. Virgin, let's take heed to these warnings, these clear words of truth. Inspiration continues from the book Great Controversy, page 603, paragraph 2. As the teachings of spiritualism are accepted by the churches, the restraint imposed upon the carnal heart is removed, and the profession of religion will become a cloak to conceal the basest iniquity. A belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and thus the influence of evil angels will be felt in the churches. From 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, we read, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, sorry, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is showing us that people stays dead until the resurrection. And we know that there are several resurrections, not just this one that is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. But we will not go into that in this lesson, but we will tag a video into this week's video so you can learn more about this resurrection. Yes, remember we did it last year, so we will tag that video into this one so you can refresh your minds on it. So we'll move forward. So inspiration tells us from Great Controversy, page 588, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, that is, the immortality of the soul, the latter, the Sunday sacredness, creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible, and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. And this is what inspiration truly meant when she says, the latter, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome because both are now mixed, spiritualism with Christianity. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be steered. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. In amazement, they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church falling because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. Great Controversy, page 606 and 607, or Evangelism, 43, 4. Brethren, these warnings are solid. I trust that we have learned, that we are enlightened, that we will not fall into the traps of the enemy. We pray you have been blessed. We'll now hand over to Sister Cherry to continue the lesson. Thank you, Sister Akins. So we are looking at Babylon, the center of sun worship. We are told that sun worship was prominent in Egypt, Assyria, Persia, and certainly Babylon. 
right? We are given Ezekiel chapter 8 to look at, 8, 16. 2 Kings 23, 5 to 11. What did the prophet, prophets write about the influence of sun worship in Israel and Judah? The prophet Ezekiel is contemporary of Daniel, pictured some of God's people with their backs toward the temple of God, worshiping the sun towards the east. Instead of worshiping the creator of the sun, they are worshiping the sun instead. So we're going to look at these chapters to see what took place in ancient Israel and what does it have in connection with us today as God's people, as spiritual Israel, as modern day Israel. Look around at how prevalent Sunday worship is in Christian church. What should these facts teach us about how pervasive is Satan's deceptions are? Again, as with the state of the dead, what is our only safeguard? So these are what we are going to look at. So we first we're looking at the influence of sun worship in Israel and Judah even up to this day, right? We are given Ezekiel 8, 16, but I want us in our spare time, or even if we could pause the video, read through the entire chapter of Ezekiel chapter 8 and see what God's ancient people did. That is the result why Ezekiel 9 was pronounced for God's people. And there were nowhere in, in the history of time where it had shown that Ezekiel has taken place. A matter of fact, Sister White sp specifically tells us that Ezekiel 9 would take place among us as a people of the last day as seven Adventists. So let us read Ezekiel 8, 16 and make sure that we are not practicing or we should say I'm not learning. See where we are not learning from ancient Israel because they had turned their backs to worship the sun. We as Seventh-day Adventists will never get up one day and say I'm going to worship the sun. But we may be practicing some of the, the, the practices that they did in connection with sun worship. And this is what we're going to look at. So Ezekiel 8, 16 says, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs turned toward the temple of the Lord and their face towards the east and they worship the sun towards the east. And I just want to remind us that we are told that we have done worse than they. We have the example of ancient Israel and if we do not learn from it, we are in no better position than they are. Jeremiah 10, 2-4 tells us what? Thus said the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. Those who worship the sun are heathens. We should learn not the way of them. All of the practice that they do. It says, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cut at a tree of the forest. The works of the hand of the workman with axe, with the axe, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. And as we read this text of Jeremiah 10, chapter verses 2 to 4, we see where it's coming from. It's talking about Christmas because that's where Christmas came from as well. Though the, world declare, though the word of the Lord declares, learn not the way of the heathen. Professed Sabbath keepers will cut a tree from the forest and deck it with silver and gold, then dare to call it by the name of Christ. Christmas tree. What greater blasphemy can one do? Jesus said God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And this is the reason why the Lord tells us, learn not the way of the heathens. Are we learning the way of the heathens today? All right, let's continue. John heard the men defying God, saying then in Revelation 13, 4, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That is, 
who can abolish this pagan system of worship? Is there anyone? They challenge God's authority. It may not be said by words, but it is most decidedly expressed by action. Men's discernment is affected by sin. And when an attempt is made to associate the sacred with the common or pagan, they see no evil. And that is why you see sometimes so many things creep into our midst. I will see no evil with it. We mix what? The sacred with the paganism, the sacred with the common. Second Kings 23, 5 and 11 tells us, And he put down the idolatrous priests, whom the king of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the city of Judah, and in the place round about Jerusalem, them also that buried incense, on, burned incense, sent unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the hosts of heaven. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun at the entering into the house of the Lord by the chamber of Natalmelech, the ch chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. This is what they did. And God dealt with them. And if we, as his people, as his present truth, practicing people, claim to be, are not doing what God asks us to do, and we are learning the ways of the heathen, God is going to deal with us. And hence the reason he said he will purify his church. What communion had light with darkness, and what conquered had Christ with Belial? What part had he that believed with an infidel? And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God had said what? I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be he separate, said the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you. And he shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And we explained before what it means to come out and be separate. Come out from what? These practices. Separate yourself from them. These unclean things God says, and I will receive you. This is the counsel that we are getting. So we are going to look at some of the pagan practices of the sun worship that they have practiced and are still practicing and some of which some of which we as a people have accepted as well so we have the conscious state of the dead which we do not as a people accept we believe according to ecclesiastes 9 5 that when you're dead that's it until christ resurrect you the eternal torment of the wicked, we don't believe that. We do not believe in the baptism by sprinkling. We do not believe it. Sunday is God's Sabbath. We believe the seven days is God's Sabbath. And there are certain conditions of the millennium that are not biblical. We don't believe them. Christmas. We don't believe in Christmas, but some of our people are practicing the ways of the pagan. And, um, and we read it before. The Lord said what? Learn not the way of the heathen. We have Easter keeping among so many other things that was originated in ancient Babylon from all pagan religion in honor of their son God. This is what the real meaning is behind it. When you do research, when you do a deep research and see where these things come from, that's where they come from. Reading from Reflecting Christ, it says, When the book of the law was found in the house of the Lord in the time of ancient Israel, it was read before Josiah the king. And he rent his garments and bid the men in holy office to inquire of the Lord for him and for his people, for they, what? they have departed from the statues of the Lord. He called together all the men of Israel, and the words of the book were read in the hearing of the congregation. The sin of the rulers and the people was a 
was pointed out. And the king stood up before them and confessed his transgression. He manifested his repentance and made a covenant to keep the statues of the Lord with his whole heart. Josiah did not rest until the people did all they could to return from the war, backsliding and serve the living God. So oftentimes we look at ancient Israel and we say, oh, we will not do the things that they have done. But guess what? Some of these practices have crept in among us as God's people, and we believe in them and we practice them too. Is not this our work today? Yes, in terms of what? Not resting until we have returned to the Lord until we are serving him. Our fathers has transgressed and we have followed in their footsteps. But God had opened the book of the law and backslidden Israel hear the commandments of the Lord. Their transgression stand revealed and the wrath of God will be upon every soul that does not repent and reform as the light shine upon his pathway. So as the light shine upon a path, the question is asked, what will we do? So we end here on the Tuesday and we hand over to Sister Akins. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry, for so ably taking us through. And that was a very detailed study there. So we move forward to a call to faithfulness. So since we see what we have been doing wrong, following in the way of the heathen, then we need to make some changes. We need to take stock of ourselves, turn the searchlight in, and make decided efforts to be faithful to God. So we do not, we will not be swept away with all the deceptions that the enemy has planned. So we see that the Woman of Revelation 17, while she's riding the beast, there is havoc going on in the world. When we read that first paragraph, that's what it is saying to us. But at the same time, the people of God, while all those falsehoods are being practiced and people are being deceived and being swept away, at the same time, the people of God are maligned, ridiculed, oppressed, and persecuted. Because what? Because they decide to be faithful. But in Christ and through the power of his Holy Spirit, they are steadfast in their commitment. Brethren, I pray that this will be us, us who are listening to this video or who are studying these lessons. All the powers of hell and the forces of evil cannot break God's, sorry, cannot break their loyalty to Christ. And what did Christ say? They Gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. It will not prevail against his people. The very elect will not be deceived. They are secure in him. He is their refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, as the psalmist said. God is calling an end time people back to faithfulness to his word. Jesus prayed, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And that is our memory text, yes? Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. It is the truth of God lived in the life that will sanctify us, that will enable us to have that Christ-like character, that will able, enable us to wear the wedding garment, which we need before we can enter into eternal life. So we have Ezekiel 21 to 20 to read and study. What is the gist of Ezekiel's message here? And how does the Sabbath fit in with this call to faithfulness? Ezekiel 20 is an earnest appeal for Israel. And who are Israel? It's us, brethren. It is an earnest appeal for Israel to forsake pagan practices and to worship the Creator instead of their false gods. We learn just now in, in Tuesday's section that Christmas keeping, Easter keeping, these are pagan systems. We need to set them aside. God is calling us to put away these things. For Babylon is falling. 
let's move forward and see what more we can learn, what lessons we can take for ourselves from the book of Ezekiel chapter 20. So we read in Ezekiel 21 to 7, and it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, Are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, said the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will thou judge then, son of man? Will thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers, and say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, in the day when I come, sorry, in the day when I choose Israel, and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God, in the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. So here God has called his people and he had said certain things to them that they should stay away from the idolatry, but they rebelled against God. And God's anger is boiling against them. And he has decided to pour out his fury upon them. Brethren, what the ancient prophets wrote is written for our time. Yes, inspiration tells us. And Ezekiel 20, 11 and 12 says, And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. So the Sabbath is a sign between us and God to show that we have been sanctified by him. Inspiration commenting says, Wherefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. These words are full of instruction and comfort. Because the Sabbath was made for man, it is the Lord's day. It belongs to Christ. For all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. It points to him as both the creator and the sanctifier. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. So without keeping God's Sabbath, how are we sanctified? We cannot be sanctified. No, we cannot be made holy. Ezekiel 20, 12 is saying to us that it is God's Sabbath. By keeping the Sabbath from polluting it, we are sanctified, made holy unto God. Then the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy. And it is given to all whom Christ makes holy. As a sign of his sanctifying power, the Sabbath is given to all who through Christ become a part of the Israel of God. Desire of Ages 288, paragraph 2. Inspiration continues from Patriarchs and Prophets 409, paragraph 3. During the entire 40 years in the wilderness, the people were every week reminded of the sacred obligation of the Sabbath by the miracle of the manna. Yet even this did not lead them to obedience. Though they did not venture upon so open and bold transgression, as had received such signal punishment, yet there was great laxness in the observance of the fourth commandment. We need to take a break and contemplate. How are we desecrating the Sabbath, brethren? How do we come when we get before God in his house? Do we come with reverence? As a matter of fact, in our own households, do we meet in reverence when we meet to worship God? 
We need to ponder these things. We need to learn from the experience of Israel. God declares through his prophet inspiration continues, my Sabbaths, they greatly polluted. And not only them back then, but us too. As we move forward, we learn more. So before entering the promised land, the Israelites were admonished by Moses to keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it. The Lord designed that by a faithful observance of the Sabbath command, Israel should continually be reminded of their accountability to him as their creator and their redeemer. While they should keep the Sabbath in the proper spirit, idolatry could not exist. Sorry, let me read that again. While they should keep the Sabbath in the proper spirit, idolatry could not exist. But should the claims of this precept of the Decalogue be set aside as no longer binding, the creator would be forgotten and men would worship other gods. I gave them my Sabbaths, God declared, to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. Yet they despised my judgments and walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. And in his appeal to them to return to him, he called their attention anew to the importance of keeping the Sabbath holy. I am the Lord your God, he said. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and hollow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Ezekiel 20, 12, 16, 19, and 20. Please read these chapters for yourselves or this chapter and also Deuteronomy chapter 5. We'll move, yes. So what lessons can we take away for ourselves from what has been written in Ezekiel 21 to 20 concerning Israel? For we remember that what the ancient prophets wrote are written more for us. And we read in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, that know all these things happen unto them for ensembles, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. These were not written for us just to know what happened to Israel, but they are written for us to understand what will happen to us. Yes. As we are we learning from the example of ancient Israel and are reforming where they have failed, they were Sabbath keeper. Keepers, but yet the Lord says they have profaned his Sabbath and they keep at his statutes. Inspiration declares the history of the wilderness life of Israel was chronicled for the benefit of the Israel of God to the close of time. God would have his people in these days review with a humble heart and teachable spirit the trials through which ancient Israel passed that they may be instructed in their preparation for the heavenly Canaan. Patriarchs and Prophets 293 paragraph 1. And in paragraph 2 we read, Many look back to the Israelites and marvel at their unbelief and murmuring, feeling that they themselves would not have been so ungrateful. But when their faith is tested, even by little trials, they manifest no more faith or patience than did ancient Israel. And commenting elsewhere, inspiration says, the, the, the angel declares, ye have done worse than they. So just imagine that. We criticize them for what they have done, but we have done worse than they. Inspiration reminds us from Testimony, Volume 5, page 217. The church has turned back from following Christ her leader and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Doubt and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. Satan would have it thus. Brethren, it is true, it is Satan that would have it thus. But we need not be his agents. Let us learn from Israel. These things or this statement is very solemn and not very 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 pretty it is something we should be ashamed of so i want to encourage us to seek christ to seek to be obedient trust not in our own 
ideas, but take God at his word. Trust in him at all times. Lean on him and let him direct us and let us not continue in the path that seems right to us. God bless you. Sister Cherry, you will now take us through Thursday's lesson. Thank you very much, Sister Akins. So we are looking at grace for obedience. This is the, the heading under Thursday, June the 1st. The text we are given a Revelation 18, 4 and 5. What is God's appeal to multitudes still in fallen religious organization? We are going to look into that. We are given 4 John 3 and 4, 3 plus 4 to compare with Romans 14, 23. And we are asked, how does the Bible define sin? And how do, do these Bible passages harmonize? So we are going to look at them. We have them all on a slide here. A call to obedience. Revelation 14, Revelation 18, 4 and 5 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God, and God had remembered. And God hath remember her iniquities. Revelation 18, 2 tells us, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, I, I just want us to look at verse 2. It says, A and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, What Babylon is the greatest fallen is fallen. And when you look at verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. So a cry is made, saying, with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fallen. And another voice is heard saying, Come out of her, my people. So the question is asked, has Babylon fallen as yet? And we look at that in last week's lesson. And again, we are looking at it this week. And the answer is no. Babylon has not fallen as yet. Inspiration declares, Babylon has not actually fallen as yet. The change is a progressive one. And the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. That is why the angel of Revelation 18, you hear the announcement again in that chapter because it was a future event and it is still a future event because Babylon has not fallen yet. Not yet can it be said that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this and you'll find these in last day's event. Page 198. The second angel message is again to be given to the world by that other angel who lightened the earth with his glory. And we read that in Revelation 18 because the announcement was made in Revelation 14, but it was a future event according to inspiration. So the announcement was to be made again in Revelation 18. So after the earth is lightened, after the angel of Revelation 18, one enlightened the earth, then it is that Babylon falls. The substance of the second angel's message is again given to the world by the other angel, says inspiration, who lightens the earth with, the, with his glory. That is the angel of Revelation 18. These messages all blend together in one to come before the people in the closing days of this earth's history. All the world will be tested, and all that have been in the darkness of error in regard to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will understand the last message of mercy that is to be given to, the, to men. Everybody is going to have an opportunity to accept or reject God's truth. 
But what God really wants for us as his people to do now is to set our house in order, get ourselves together to go out to do a mighty work. This is what the Lord wants us to do. We continue. This is from Great Controversy. 390, paragraph 2, and the book before was selected messages. Revelation 18 points to the time when, as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, remember we just read that they blend together as one, right? The church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel. So it's after this happened, the church would reach the fulfillment of it. And the call will be made to come out of Babylon to separate from her communion, right? That's God's people who are still there. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world. And it will accomplish its work. When those that believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive what strong delusion and believe a lie. Then the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it. So the truth is not going to shine on you if you are not open to receive it. God doesn't force what he has on anyone. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call come out of her, my people. Because God have people out there in, in Babylon. So faithful. The light which attend this angel penetrate everywhere as he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and it become the habitation of devils, right? And the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean hateful bird. The message of the fall of Babylon as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mention of the corruption which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join the last great work of the third angel's message. So the work of which angel? The angel of Revelation 18.1. The angel that came to give power and force to the third angel's message. It says, as it swells to a loud cry, and the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation, which they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them, and they united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. Babylon will fall after God's church is purified. This is what God is waiting God says what? He will have a people pure and true. Let's read it in volume five of the testimonies to the churches, page 80 to 82. You can read all of these by yourself. It says, but the days of the church, of the purification of the church, are hastening on apace. God will have a people pure and true. In the mighty sifting soon to take place, we shall better be able to measure the strength of Israel. Is it Israel of all that is it talking about? No, Israel, Seventh-day Adventists. When God is purifying his church, we will then know. It says the signs reveal that the time is near when the Lord will manifest that his hand, his fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. Those who have trusted in to intellect, genius, or talent will not stand at the head of the rank of the, 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 the file, rank and file. This is what we are being told. We continue in evangelism, page 66, paragraph 3. God's work is to be carried forward with power. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that God will add to the ranks of his people, men of ability and influence who are to act their part in one in the world. Not all in the world are lawless and sinful. You hear that? Not all in the world are lawless and sinful. God has many thousands who have not bowed their knee to Baal. 
There are God-fearing men and women in the fallen churches. Look at the Protestant churches. Look at the other churches. Even though they are following the doctrines of Rome, those who are out there, God's people who are out there, faithful to the things that they know. And when the truth comes to them, they will not hesitate. They will hear the call, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, come out of her, my people. Many of the honest in, the, in heart are gasping for a breath of life from heaven. They will recognize the gospel when it is brought to them in the beauty and simplicity with which is presented in God's word. Not until this clean work is accomplished can God logically say to those who are in Babylon to come out of her, my people, that he be not partakers of her sins and that which you receive not of her plagues, according to Revelation 18.4. Indeed, where he do, where were he to do, no better than simply bringing them into another place where sin still abounds, he might far better leave them right where they are. This final work for the church, being of such great importance, is still further elucidated in the prophecy of Malachi 3. We should read it. Take time to read these things. Meditate on them whenever we have the time. So God's people at the time can no more serve the Lord in Babylon and in Egypt than they could have in the days of Ezra or in the days of Moses. For when the plagues are poured out upon Babylon, as the fire and brimstone were poured out upon Sodom and Gomorrah, then if they be living among the whirlwinds, they can no more be, they can no more escape the damage of the plagues than Lot could have survived the fire had he stayed in Sodom. So all who want to escape the foretold ruin verily must come out of Babylon as Lot and his family came out of Sodom. The remnant who are faithful to God's doctrines are only a small portion of the people of God's word of God. Most of them are what? Still inside Babylon. Hence the call for his people in his church to reform and awake and prepare for what is about to take place as an overwhelming surprise to the people of God. So may we take heed. And our final comment. We read 4 John 3, 4. And what does it tell us? Whosoever commits sin transgresseth also the law. For the sin is the transgression of the law. And this is answering the question that has been asked to compare John and Romans and to say how does the Bible define sin? And how do the, the these passages harmonize, right? Now, Romans 14, 23 says, and he that Doubt it is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So the both of them define sin. We can't serve God if we don't have faith. If we are faithless people, we are sinful people. Now hear what inspiration tells us. In order to prepare for the judgment, it is necessary that men should what? Keep the law of God. That law will be the standard of character in judgment, in the judgment. The Apostle Paul declares, as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, and he says what? That the doers of the law shall be justified. Faith is essential in order to the keeping of the law of God. For with out faith, it is impossible to please God. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So you see the harmony there? You see the comparison between the two texts? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The faith that is required is not a mere ascent to doctrines. It is the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. You have faith, your soul should be purifying by the faith that you have in God and his word. Take God at his word and work in faith. Satan will come with his suggestions to make 
you distrust the word of your heavenly father. But consider whatsoever is not faith of faith is what? Sin. This is the only way in which we will gain an experience and find the evidence so essential for your peace and confidence. And I truly hope that Thursday's lesson has been a blessing to you. May God bless you as I hand over to Sister Akins to carry us through Friday. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry, for ably giving us this lesson. It has truly been a blessing to me. So we'll move into Friday and we we'll look at, we we'll repeat. We repeat this statement from Inspiration written in the Great Controversy, page 588. Repetition impresses the mind through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. And brethren, we are going to church on Sabbath, but it's not just about going to church on Sabbath. It is being obedient to every precept. It also means keeping the Sabbath holy. For when we behave in a certain way, we really do not keep the Sabbath holy. We know. So let's move forward for our final comments. If ever there was a time when we needed faith and spiritual enlightenment, it is no. Why no? Because Satan's deceptions are unleashed on the world. And listen, it's not just a deception, but myriads of deceptions. Those who are watching unto prayer and are searching the scriptures daily with an earnest desire to know and do the will of God, will not be led astray by any of the deceptions of Satan. They alone will discern the pretext which cunning men adopt to beguile and ensnare. Did you know that even your very own household member, perhaps a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister, anyone Satan can use, so, brethren, our only protection is in the word of God. We need to study the word of God and live by them. So, inspiration continues. So much time and attention are bestowed upon the world, upon dress and eating and drinking, that no time is left for prayer and the study of the scriptures. That's very bad, isn't it? Right. We need to do better. May God help us. That as we internalize these lessons, we will, we will give our all to Jesus, for that's what he needs, our all. If we give him our all, we will be protected. But if we give him a peace, no, and tomorrow another peace, and we never fully surrender to him, what will happen to us? We'll be swept away. May God help us. Sister Cherry, will you please close us in prayer? Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the reminder that we are to turn away from the way that seemeth right to the straight and narrow path, the way that leads to everlasting life. So help us, the Lord, as difficult as our situations may be, there are aid you have placed in our positions, aid to help us to move and to climb up to the map that you have set forth for us. So be with each and every one of us who are listening here, I pray. Continue to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. And bye from Sabbath School, brethren. We pray you have been blessed.